welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 14 of the Madden America podcast. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone who's gotten in touch, either by email or by commenting on Madden America. Your comments, feedback and support are most welcome. This week, I've had the honour of interviewing Dr. Irving Kirsch. Dr. Kirsch is Associate Director of the Programme in Placebo Studies and Lecturer in Medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He is also Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Plymouth and University of Hull in the UK and the University of Connecticut in the US. He has published 10 books and more than 250 scientific journal articles and book chapters on placebo effects, antidepressant medication, hypnosis, and suggestion. He originated the concept of response expectancy. His meta-analyses on the efficacy of antidepressants were covered extensively in the international media and influenced official guidelines for the treatment of depression in the United Kingdom. His 2009 book, The Emperor's New Drugs, Exploding the Antidepressant Myth, was shortlisted for the prestigious Mind Book of the Year Award and was the topic of a 60-minute segment on CBS and a five-page cover story in Newsweek. In this interview, we discuss Dr. Kirsch's research into the placebo effect and the efficacy of the drugs used for depression. Dr. Kirsch, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. Firstly, I wanted to ask about your background and how you came to be involved in psychology and your research around the placebo effect and antidepressant drugs. I uh, became interested in psychology taking an undergraduate psychology course uh, in California. And what particularly interested me was how people learn, how people's uh, behavior gets influenced. And I became aware of behavior therapy. This was back in the 1970s, early 1970s, I became aware of behavior therapy, the research on it, became convinced that these were therapeutic approaches that worked, but I doubted the rationale that was given, the reasoning behind them. Uh, Behavior therapy was based on conditioning theories like Pavlovian conditioning and operant conditioning, didn't have much room for cognition for how people thought and interpreted what was uh, going on. And it seemed to me that um, a large part of the effect was probably due to the beliefs that people had. And that led me to looking at the placebo effect, because that's based on uh, beliefs and expectancies that uh, people have. So that got me into that area. And I uh, began doing research in the placebo effect while I was a graduate student. And Getting to antidepressant drugs was actually because of the placebo effect. I wasn't interested in antidepressant drugs. I was sure that they worked. I knew that they worked just like everyone else uh, knew that they worked. I was working uh, at that point as a faculty member in psychology at the University of Connecticut and also had a small practice where I was seeing uh, clients in psychotherapy, some of them depressed clients and I would refer them to psychiatrists to get prescriptions of antidepressants if they were very depressed to aid in the psychotherapy process. But it also occurred to me that although I was sure at the time antidepressants had an effect, that there also should be a good-sized placebo effect in the treatment of depression and started investigating that with one of the graduate students that I was working with and what we found surprised both of us uh, greatly because while it was true there was a good size placebo effect, it was so large that that left very little room for a meaningful drug effect. And that was the surprise, changed my thinking about antidepressants completely uh, and led me to question whether the risks involved were worth it uh, for, for such a small benefit in, in depression. Absolutely. And I'd like to talk more about antidepressant drugs. But firstly, I wanted to ask about your research into the placebo effect, because I think sometimes people aren't aware of the power of the placebo. And I wondered if you could share some of your insights on the placebo effect with me. Well, you know, what people experience is due to two factors. It's what's coming in from the outside, from, from the bottom up, as, as is sometimes referred to. And 
it's a combination of that and what is coming from the top down, from, from the cerebral cortex, from the way people think, believe, what they want, what they hope. What a person experiences is a, an interaction of those two types of, of uh, information. And because of that, when someone believes that they're going to get better, that helps make them better. And when someone believes they're going to get worse, that helps make them worse. So you can have a placebo effect, which is a beneficial effect of a belief or an expectation. And you can also have a nocebo effect, something, a belief or, that leads you to feel worse in, in one way or, or, or another. And one of the things that we found is that there's a great number of conditions that can have, in which you can have profound placebo effects. Depression is one. Anxiety disorders is another. Irritable bowel syndrome is yet another. And also asthma and um, uh, Parkinson's disease and, of course, pain. You can exacerbate pain by having beliefs that, uh, by expecting to feel more pain. And you can ameliorate pain by having beliefs that you will feel less pain. And I just wondered, Dr. Kirsch, in your book, The Emperor's New Drugs, you discuss the fact that there is perhaps a much bigger role for placebo in conditions that have a large psychological component, such as depression or anxiety. And you go on to say the placebo is less effective in functional or physical conditions such as diabetes, for example. I just wondered why that might be. Well, that's an excellent question. Placebos can affect physical responses as well, but they are responses that are mostly, for the most part, they're responses that are um, associated with psychological states. And the, the placebo itself is having its effect through psychological means, uh, and it will um, affect those psycho uh, physical states that are associated with, with psychological states. So, for example, if you're suffering from a broken bo bone, a placebo may help you feel less pain, but it's not going to heal the, the, the bone. It's not going to heal the, the fracture. It will, however, produce changes in brain function that are consistent with a feeling of less pain. And that's one of the things we know from looking at brain imaging studies uh, on the effects of placebos. That's fascinating, isn't it? And I was also interested to read that there are even differences in response according to the color of the tablet given or if the placebo is presented as a branded drug rather than a generic version. And sometimes even if people are told that they're taking a placebo, there's still a response, isn't there? There is. And now one of the things that seems to be an important factor in that is being able to explain to people in a reasonable way why there might be a response, even if they know it's a placebo. Without that explanation, um, at the very best, at the very least, uh, um, the, the oh, place, presenting placebo and saying it's a placebo, it's going to have very little effect or may not have any effect uh, at all. But if you can explain to people, as we have done in some studies, that look, there is such a thing as a placebo effect. It's real. It can be powerful. We know some things about how it's produced, and part of how it's produced uh, and can be enhanced is by this phenomenon called classical conditioning, which almost everyone has heard about and knows about. That is what Pavlov did with the dog associating food with uh, uh, a bell, and then the bell's rung and the food isn't given, but the dog still salivates. So people have had through their lives uh, experiences like that where they've taken active drugs that are beneficial, that can make a difference, and have come to associate the very ritual of taking the drug uh, with the benefits that they've received. And so they've learned how to, our bodies have learned how to make use of the placebo effect in that way. And, and so we have told people with suffering from chronic low back pain, and other, in another study with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, that uh, we thought that the placebo could help them, even if they know it's a placebo, and we ask them to take two placebo pills twice a day, so a total of four pills a day, letting them know there's no active ingredient, but also letting them know that it might be of benefit uh, for them. And in both studies, we found that that produced a, an improvement in their symptoms, 
which was not produced in control groups that were not given the placebo. There's a really interesting ethical dilemma there, because I'm sure there are times that a doctor would feel that a patient would respond well to a placebo and not have the associated risk of adverse effects that the active drug has. But by not prescribing an active drug, we could be misleading patients. No, we shouldn't mislead patients. And I think honesty is important and being able to trust your caregiver is important. But that's one of the things that is exciting me and my colleagues um, about what we call open label placebo, being able to give people a placebo without deception, because then you avoid that ethical problem. Thank you. And I wanted to move on now to talk a little about your research into the efficacy of antidepressant drugs. In your book, The Emperor's New Drugs, you describe going from a doubter to a disbeliever where the efficacy of antidepressant drugs is concerned. And I wanted to ask how that change in your thinking occurred, because there are very few who will publicly question the efficacy of these medications. Yeah, well, it occurred by looking at the evidence. As I said, I sometimes would refer depressed clients uh, to for, for prescriptions of, of antidepressants. So I wasn't even that much of a doubter. Um, I became a disbeliever looking at the evidence. And I looked at the evidence not because I was interested in evaluating antidepressants, but because I was interested in in, uh, examining the placebo effect in the area of depression. One of the things that's uh, characteristic of of depression is a sense of hopelessness, feelings of hopelessness. And one of the things that depressed people might feel hopeless about is their own condition, their their depression, in, in the sense that Gee, I'll never get out of this uh, terrible state that I'm in. And when you give someone a new treatment, say, well, we have this new treatment we think might work, that will tend to counter the hopelessness. So that, that sh- And that, that should lead to some improvement in mood. So we thought there should be a good-sized placebo effect in, in depression, and we found a good size placebo effect in the treatment of depression. We we looked at uh, um, people who, clinical trials in which depressed patients had gotten a placebo and clinical trials in which they had been given no treatment at all. And we found there is a big difference. But in looking at those data, the only place we could find clinical trials where people had been given a placebo were drug trials. And so we had the data on the drugs as well. And that's how we got surprised at how small the difference was and uh, led to seeing that, well, the difference between drug and placebo, people get better on the drug, they get better on the placebo, but the difference is so small that it's not clinically meaningful. People are, when people are getting better on antidepressants, uh, and antidepressants, that's largely, if not completely, due to the placebo effect and the passage of time. Well, there's a fascinating part of the book where you describe your research into a range of different drugs that affect different neurotransmitters, some serotonin, some dopamine, and some norepinephrine. And yet they all seemed to display similar efficacy, and yet given how different their actions are, you might reasonably expect the outcomes to be very different. Yeah, they're virtually identical in in the degree of improvement they produce, and that includes a very strange drug called tianeptine. The most common antidepressants are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they're supposed to uh, inhibit the reuptake of a neurotransmitter called serotonin so that there's more serotonin available in the brain. Tianeptine, instead of being an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, is an SSRE, a selective serotonin reuptake enhancer. It's supposed to do chemically exactly the opposite of what SSRIs do. Now, it's supposed to enhance the reuptake of of serotonin so that there's less serotonin available. If there were any truth to the theory that depression is due to not having enough serotonin available in the brain, then tianeptine, this SSRE, ought to make people worse. Instead, It makes people better when it's presented as an antidepressant, and the degree of improvement is exactly the same as you get with SSRIs. That was fascinating to read and starkly highlights that we understand so little about the underlying causes of mental health problems. And the fact that there's still this societal belief that the chemical imbalance is what underlies the epidemic of so-called mental illness, but your research completely blows that out of the water. 
Well, thank you. The, it's not just my research. It's actually looking at the research of many, many, many different scholars and, and uh, trying to put it all together. And yes, the, the chemical imbalance theory is without much empirical foundation. There's, it's just a, pretty much a myth. And you also explain in the book how many antidepressant clinical trials are flawed and potentially biased because the obvious nature of antidepressant side effects means that patients and doctors can easily guess if the drug is real or if they're taking a placebo. I'm aware that there have been attempts to circumvent that by using an active placebo, and I wanted to ask what effect does using an active placebo have on these clinical trials? Sure. Well, one thing, let me go back to part of what you said, that that patients noticing side effects um, might indeed break blind and realize they're getting the active uh, drug. And in fact, we have evidence that they, that they do. Usually they don't ask, you know, what do you, what do you think you've been given, a, the drug or the placebo? But when they do ask, most people who've been given the drug recognize, oh, I've been given the real drug, probably as a, a function of, of uh, the side effects in, in, in the drug, because when they're recruited for the trials, one of the things you have to do in getting informed consent to be part of a clinical trial is you have to inform the person of what the side effects are. And uh, not just that there are side effects, but exactly what they are. So then when someone experiences a side effect that's consistent with what they've been told, they're very likely to conclude, oh, okay, that means I'm in the active drug condition. Now, to get around that, there have been about nine trials, They're very old trials, actually, um, but there are nine trials in which uh, people were given what's called an active placebo. An active placebo is a drug that's not supposed to have any effect on the condition being treated at all, but produces some side effects that might be similar to the side effects experienced on the active drug. So now people are less likely to break blind to, to figure out that they, they're in the drug condition uh, or that they're in the placebo condition uh, because the placebo is also producing side effects. In those trials, you're much, much less likely to get a significant difference between drug and placebo than when you use a, an inert placebo, placebo without side effects. So they discovered that and of course, they don't use active placebos in drug research, and they don't use it because it decreases the chance of uh, getting a, a significant difference between drug and placebo. And most of the research is being done by the pharmaceutical company that wants to get marketing approval. They want to get the ability to market their uh, drug from regulatory agencies like the FDA, and they want to do everything they can to maximize the chance that they show a difference between drug and placebo, not to minimize it. And in your opinion, Dr. Kerr, should we be insisting that clinical trials for the drugs used for mental health conditions use an active placebo? Would that improve the quality and reliability of the results? I think the first thing we should do is routinely ask patients what they think they've been given relatively early in, on in the trial, maybe before there's been a chance for too much of a therapeutic effect yet, but enough time for side of effects to, to be, have become noticeable and see how that correlates with outcome and see if we control for that statistically, what effect does that have on the drug placebo difference? It would be so cheap as to be cost free to do that. Just to ask that one question. What, what, what do you, Think which group do you think you're in? Have you are you in the placebo group? Are you in the real group? And how confident are you of, of that? Again, your book explains really clearly how the pharmaceutical manufacturers stack the cards in favor of the drug by selecting only the trials with positive outcomes, by publishing positive results many times, and pre-selecting people who are likely to respond well to the drug. So I can see that any move to open up the clarity and transparency of the trials may not be welcome. Right. Also, the conclusions in your book are very clear, and in the first few pages it shows how much of a person's response to an antidepressant is placebo, and how little is the drug effect. And you describe in the book how controversial your conclusions were at the time. And I wanted to ask how you felt about the criticism of the research findings, and how you responded. Well, I 
anticipated that they would be controversial and uh, since it went against the grain of what everybody believed and uh, was not surprised that it was. I was actually pleased that it was controversial because it means that, that at least people were reading it, people were taking it into account, people were having to deal with it and not just uh, ignoring it. Uh, when we did our first meta-analysis uh, with my graduate student, Guy Saperstein, back in 1998, we, we published that. And it was published with commentaries, pro and con. And one of the uh, critics said, well, you know, this is just one. This is, these are not all the data. There are other data. And you should look at more of the data before reaching a conclusion like that. And so we did. That's when we went to the FDA and uh, used the Freedom of Information Act to get from them data on all of the clinical trials that had been submitted to them by the drug companies in the process of gaining approval for what at that time were the six most widely prescribed antidepressants. And that gave us access to data from unpublished trials as well as published trials. And we discovered in doing that that the difference between drug and placebo was even smaller than, than uh, in, in our initial study than when we just looked at the published studies. So that didn't end the controversy, of course. The controversy has just continued and it's grown. But one of the things that have happened in, the con in, in this controversy if, is that people, critics, have tried to see if they could replicate our results, thinking that, oh, we must have done something wrong, our calculations were wrong. And there have been many new analyses since we've done ours. And the thing that's been heartening to me is the finding that everybody gets the same results. Um, whether they look at one set of studies or another set of studies, the FDA studies, different studies, uh, they analyze it one way, they analyze it another way. Everybody finds that the difference between drug and placebo is very small. It's below the criteria that has been set for um, clinical significance. Well, again, the book ties the research together and you go through your response to the individual criticisms really clearly. And I personally feel it's quite a damning indictment of antidepressant drugs. But if we look at antidepressant prescribing now, prescriptions in the UK have doubled in the last decade, and there have been similar large increases in the US, Canada, Australia, Europe, and elsewhere. The message that the drugs are only marginally better than placebo, and even then perhaps only for the severely depressed, doesn't seem to have altered prescribing practice. How should we best influence prescribers so they make better judgments about the balance of benefit versus risk with antidepressant drugs? It will take time. I think we have to keep doing what we are doing, and that is to present the data, uh, to replicate the data, to write about it, to speak about it, do things like, for me, being interviewed in, in this uh, uh, podcast, which I think is a very important uh, thing to do to help people know about the data. Medicine can be slow to change. There's a, an operation for degenerate nerve disease in the knee called arthroscopic surgery. And the studies more than, uh, see, it's now 2018. So about 15 years ago, studies came out comparing it to sham surgery, where they just open the person's knee up, close it up again without doing the surgical intervention, and showed, gee, there's no difference at all between them. People uh, get as much improvement from the sham surgery as they do from the real surgery. In fact, uh, looking at results after two weeks after the treatment and also a year after the treatment, and the first study showing that, the people getting the sham surgery, the placebo surgery, actually did a little better than those than uh, had gotten the real surgery. So it seemed like this real surgery was causing a little harm rather than producing improvement. But rates of using the uh, procedure continue to rise in, in country after country, despite the fact that the evidence showed it didn't work. But eventually things start to change. So just last year, the British Medical Journal came out with a clinical guidance recommending against the use of this surgery for almost anyone with a, a 
It's a kind of neat problem that it's used for. I do also wonder whether there's an expectation on the patient's behalf of some kind of medical intervention, either a prescription or a procedure. And I know that I've been guilty in the past of going to my doctor and expecting a medical intervention as a successful outcome. I think with the data that that we have so far would suggest that um, doing nothing is not the best approach for, for depression. Uh, people do need help. It is a serious condition. It, it, it is a very difficult condition to experience. It may be a normal reaction to a life event, but that doesn't make it any less difficult uh, to cope with. The problem is what kind of inf- in intervention. And the good news is that there are uh, many different interventions that have the same degree of effectiveness as antidepressant drugs, but without the dangers. And these would include psychotherapy, um, and it includes physical exercise, types of, med- of meditation, especially mindfulness meditation, which has been investigated more than, more than other types, seem to be helpful in the treatment of, of depression. Acupuncture has the same effect as antidepressant drugs, but all of these without uh, the various health risks and side effects that uh, the antidepressants have. So when someone who is depressed comes to a clinician, I would do more than just say, well, let's wait and it will pass. I will we'll talk about various treatment options and see which one might be uh, more acceptable to the patient, but safe options, not dangerous ones. And some of the large increases in antidepressant prescribing is for off-label uses. For example, in my own case, I was prescribed an antidepressant for anxiety and phobias rather than for depression. And people are often prescribed them for chronic pain or tinnitus and even insomnia. Since the efficacy of antidepressants is questionable for their primary role of helping depressed patients, can we infer anything about their efficacy for off-label uses? No, you can't infer anything one way or the other until it's been tested. And the problem with off-label use is it has been not been tested, or at least has not been tested to the degree that you can show some kind of efficacy in in clinical trials, allowing the it to become on label, allowing it to be approved approved by regulators for the treatment of a particular disorder. So there's a danger in prescribing. Uh, off-label, meaning for conditions for which the drug has not been approved, um, and the danger resides in we don't know because we haven't done the research. And uh, my sense is that if you think it would be useful in the treatment of insomnia or tinnitus or some other disorder for which it has not been approved, then do the research to show it, get it approved uh, for that condition, if you can find the data uh, indicating that it is effective. Dr. Kirsch, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. It was such an interesting conversation, and it's crucial that we address the science and evidence behind antidepressant drugs, because I feel that quite a lot of the evidence has been buried, and that doesn't feel right. You're absolutely right, James. I'm so grateful to Dr. Kirsch for talking with me for the podcast, and I'm sure that you found the interview enlightening. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America this week, Sadie Cathcart reports on a recent German study published in Frontiers in Neurology. The study reports on the adverse effects of using antidepressants to reduce chronic pain. Results point to several potential side effects associated with common antidepressants that merit consideration, particularly from a public health perspective. According to the researchers, patient experiences of chronic pain stemming from a spectrum of conditions, including those of mixed or unknown etiology, are commonly addressed through the prescription of antidepressants by medical professionals. The meta-analytic assessment of the clinical trials included the antidepressants amitriptyline, nortriptyline, desipramine, milnasopran, venlafaxine, duloxetine, mirtazapine, and fluoxetine. Researchers identified adverse effects compared to placebo for all antidepressants examined other than nortriptyline. These effects included but are not limited to dry mouth, dizziness, nausea, headache, and constipation. 
The study authors report that chronic pain affects 36% of the US population and 19% of the population in Europe. Chronic conditions are often biologically, psychologically and socially wearing, and represent a substantial financial burden to healthcare systems on an international scale. Because antidepressants prescribed in low doses have been found to relieve pain associated with migraines, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis and other debilitating conditions, the team sought to examine the tolerability and demonstrated risks associated with this form of treatment. Following a systematic literature review of clinical trials reporting the results of antidepressants in treating chronic pain, they extracted and cross-compared the sample number of patients, drug used as therapy, and the occurrence of side effects across 69 studies that satisfied inclusion criteria. Further statistical analyses were conducted to examine factors including differences in incidences of adverse effects, withdrawal due to adverse effects, and differences in specific adverse effect profiles. Findings from this study warn of higher adverse effects compared to placebo for all but one antidepressant studied, and potential withdrawal symptoms. Co-medication use may also serve to further complicate individual experiences with antidepressants to reduce chronic pain. The conflict posed by these results is that efforts to manage one's experience of a certain set of uncomfortable symptoms through the channel of antidepressants may mean substituting one form of suffering for another. As an example, the most prevalent adverse effects found to be associated with amitriptyline use were dry mouth, headache, body weight gain, thirst and constipation. Although migraines and headaches are two distinct conditions, there is indisputable irony in using amitriptyline to combat one's migraines and suffering headaches as a result. Aptly summarised by the researchers, these findings might be useful in multimodal treatment which takes patient comorbidities and co-medication into consideration. The pathophysiology of the underlying disease, comorbidities, lifestyle and co-medication should be taken into consideration when determining the use of an antidepressant in patients with chronic pain. Temporary solutions for subduing pain should not overshadow the exploration of holistic and non-pharmacological possibilities for relieving the experience of chronic pain for those suffering. For more on this and other news, reports and comment, visit maddenamerica.com. So thank you for listening. Please come back next week for another episode. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.